So I know we were looking at the gifts and being involved, and, and but I'm putting that aside for now. This title this morning is, Do You Know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Or do you know about Jesus? And there's a huge difference knowing Jesus or knowing about Jesus. Sometimes somebody asks us about Jesus and we can list off all these maybe characteristics, all these things. That's like a person. You might be able to list off all these various things. But do you know him? Do you know his God, Jesus' innermost thoughts and his desires and what he longs for, for each of us. Do you really know him? It's like getting to know a person. There's a lot of people we can say we know, but do we actually know them? Have we taken time to get to know somebody enough so we know where they're at and what they're feeling? Have we taken the time to get to know Jesus? And what we believe or what we've been taught will color what we know and think about Jesus. If we've been taught wrong, Jesus had said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. A little bit spoils the whole lump. And that yeast is, if you go back and check, it's wrong teaching. Beware of the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. And we're to be aware of the teaching we may have received, doctrines and traditions that we've embraced that are not true. And it might be just one, and I know I have been in the past accused of saying everything's black or white and there's no gray. With God's word, that's the way it is. The minute you start treading gray, it's muddy waters, and you're starting to believe things that aren't quite right, and it will affect your relationship, what you know about Jesus. It will color our thinking. Because then if it's something wrong that we're believing about Jesus, then our acting will be wrong. So let's look at Philippians 3, 9 to 10. I find this such an amazing verse that, that Paul is saying this. And be found in him not having my own righteousness. And every, I can ask everybody here and they'll say, no, it's not my righteousness. That's the righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And next thing you know, we start getting into works. What do I have to do? which is from the law, Paul's saying, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And it's, to start with, it's vital that we know we're new creatures in Christ. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Next verse. And here's Paul saying, He's been with Jesus. He's written all these books of the Bible, all of this stuff. And he says that I may know him. Today is your heart cry to know him. And when you know him, the power of his resurrection flows right with it. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Part of that suffering is to walk in love, but also part of it is to... Take the stuff of the flesh, take our thoughts, and realize that Jesus died for it. To realize that he died so I might be rich and put aside my own thinking, put those thoughts to death. Put what I think about Jesus and the word to death. And that sometimes, when you're having to put your ideas aside or things that you've been trained in aside, it almost seems like death. Jesus said, not my will, but the Father's will. And that's not easy to do. That's not easy to do. Because with wrong teaching, we have wrong believing. And so we're going to look at some of the areas... I don't know how many we'll get to this morning of wrong 
teaching that we've gotten that are keeping us in bondage and we're thinking wrong and because of that it's colored our knowledge of Jesus and knowing him having that intimate relationship with Jesus is difficult it's not Jesus holding out remember it's never Jesus holding out so now let's look at 2nd Peter verse 1 2 Peter, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who obtained like precious faith. He's writing to believers, you have received the same faith as Jesus, as Simon Peter. With us by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Next verse. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you want grace and peace multiplied, you've got to know. Jesus you need knowledge revelation knowledge of Jesus not about him but you need revelation of Jesus in order for grace and peace to be multiplied you want I've had people come and say will you pray for me I need peace will you pray for me to have peace and I go no sometimes you know I've thought I'll just pray for him and make him happy well they might leave happy for a few minutes but it's not going to work you cannot pray for somebody to have peace. This is how you get more peace. And the peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's on the inside of you. And we need to release what's on the inside of us. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So peace, your peace, the multiplication of grace and peace is linked to your knowledge of God and of Jesus. This is huge. Verse 3. So, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things pertaining to life and godliness, his divine power has already given to us. But if we want to access it, we need the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. You see, everything we need has been given to us. But we're not going to walk in it without the knowledge of Jesus, of his finished work, of what he's done for us. You know... So many believers, and, and I've been there, you know what he wants us to have. He know I knew what he wanted for me, but I wasn't getting it. I mean, I wasn't walking in that divine power that he's given to us. And it's through the knowledge of him. If our knowledge is wrong, if our thinking about Jesus is wrong, that divine power is not going to work through us, and we're not going to walk in all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we need to have a revelation, and, and, and it's probably on the website, the finished works of Jesus. We need a revelation of what we already have in Jesus. And so when we got born again, when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. We're a new creature. Our spirit man is born again. Our spirit man is completely made new. We have within us a brand new spirit. It was born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, the word of God. And you have the entire word of God in your spirit. Your spirit is exactly the same as Jesus' spirit. It's in your spirit. But when we got born again, our mind still had stinking thinking. And our body still had its own desires. And when we say body, we're talking about the five physical senses. So what we need to do is change the way we think. Or we're not going to experience what we've been given. And that's through the knowledge of Jesus. So we already have everything in our spirit. But it's to get it from our spirit flowing out. You see, we already have faith. It's a fruit of the Spirit. 
We have to know how to use it. Deliberately on purpose and not just accidentally think we're going to fall into it. Prosperity is given. We need to learn the laws of prosperity. We need to learn the laws of healing. And that's not bondage. And what are the laws? Getting a, the knowledge of Jesus. Verse 4. By which have been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Exceeding great and precious promises. And through these exceeding great and precious promises, which we get through the knowledge, we are partakers of God's nature. And then we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now lust is the inroad of corruption. And that means um, too often when we see lust, we think sexual only. But it's a strong desire for anything. And we should never have a strong desire for anything more than our strong desire for Jesus. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Because if he's not our number one strong desire, everything else is going to go wrong. So, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Let's look at 3 John 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. Read the last part to me. Is it automatic? Are you going to prosper in all things and be in health if your soul, your mind is not prosperous? But we kind of think, well, God's made me prosperous. It's up to him. He said he wants me to prosper. He said he's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. But it's through the knowledge, through your soul prospering. That's the only way. God wants you well. But we won't walk in that health and that prosperity if our soul, our mind, is not prospering according to the word of God. And I showed you, and I can show you others, but I also showed you from 2 Peter that we have it through the knowledge of Jesus. Not the knowledge of anything else. Now, it's not wrong to have a knowledge of Isaiah and all these prophets that went, Ezekiel. But if you read the books of the Bible, all these books, their main theme is Jesus. Every book of the Bible talks about Jesus. And when we read the word, we're to see Jesus. It's not a history book, people. It's alive, full of power. And we're always to see Jesus. It's through the knowledge of Jesus. So when you're reading something, see Jesus. And if, what you're, if you're reading a book other than the Bible and you're not seeing Jesus, throw it away. Any book that's not proclaiming Jesus doesn't need to be read. Now I understand if you're studying to be a lawyer or a doctor. I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. Okay, let's understand here. But there's books out there that... that are weird and they say they're Christian books and you can read them and they don't even mention Jesus in them. So we remember our spirits are already perfect. Our souls only prosper as we renew our minds to what we already have to Jesus. Romans 12, 1 to 3. I beseech you therefore... Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And I've, you know, I used to think, okay. And I really kind of skipped over that because, you know, I wanted to get to two to renew my mind. But you're, you have to make a decision that your body's going to be obedient to the word of God because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, I hear about crucifying the flesh. Well, if you're talking about crucifying, killing it, God doesn't want you dead. 
So what we are actually presenting to God, a living sacrifice which is holy, which isn't running after the things of the world, um, whatever it might be. You know, there's a whole thing. You know, uh, if you're walking in anger and unforgiveness and all those things, your body's not because your body are, is actually talking about your five physical senses. So that's just a reasonable service. It's not even, shouldn't even be a big deal for us. Next verse. So this ties in with the knowledge of Jesus and renewing our mind, our soul being prosperous. We're not to be conformed to this world. Don't think the way the world thinks. But be transformed, changed. Like on the back of that book that, that I.J. read. It's a butterfly. It was a worm. It became a butterfly. That's the transformation we're talking about. We want to be changed. It's in a cocoon and it, I guess worms don't do that. I don't know, whatever it is. But it comes forth, this beautiful butterfly. We can be that way. We'll come forth walking with all the divine attributes of God as we renew our mind and don't do it the world's way. Think the way the world does. And when you do that, you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <coughs> you knew our mind. As I said before, if we take in some wrong teaching or carry some wrong forward, we are not going to look and see Jesus the way he is. So he, let's go to Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. Ephesians 5. And in renewing our mind and seeing Jesus, we are imitators of God as dear children. What we see God doing and saying, we should be doing and saying. You said, oh, I can't do what God does. Well, Jesus said, the works that I do shall ye do, and greater works than these shall you do. So we have to see that. We have to imitate God. We have to speak like God. God called Abraham the father of many nations before he ever had a child. That's the way God does things. And we're to imitate him. We're to act and talk like he does. Next verse. And walk in love. And we saw that walking in love as Christ also has loved us. And that's huge. You're not walking in love under your own strength. The love of God's been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. But as Jesus loved me, as I focus and I learn from the word how much Jesus loved me, that love automatically flows to another person. You see, I know, and it's been said, and I've said it, and I've heard others say it. Well, you can love them, but not like them. And I was thinking about that. And I thought, you know, that's not right. That's splitting hairs. That's really saying, ugh, God told me to love you, but, ugh. No, I might not like and approve their behavior because of what they've taken in or, or how they are. But when you love somebody, you see them as Jesus sees them, and then you even like them. You just don't like their behavior. You might not like the words that come out of their mouths. But look, Jesus loved us so much, he died for us when we didn't even know to call on him. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we would have never known. So it's easy to love as long as we focus on how Jesus loved us. But if we start having to look at loving, and that's old covenant, it's, old, it's under the law, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what happens when you don't love yourself? Well, today I don't love myself, so I don't have to love my neighbor? You see, it's all straight. What it's doing there, it's old covenant. You do something, then God does something. We've got it where God's doing something, and now we just respond to what he's done. Amen? 
Imitate God, walk in love. What else was in that verse? I didn't quite finish reading it. As Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Are you willing to offer yourself a sacrifice and lay down your life, something you wanted to do, but somebody needs you, and you're willing to put that aside? for somebody, to change your plans because somebody needs you, or the church has something going on so you rearrange your schedule, as Christ loved us. Hallelujah. So one teaching that I believe has, can color how we think about God And uh, you know what, Ashlyn, I'm going to get back to uh, that scripture, John, but I want to skip down to Genesis chapter 1 first. Just going to change that order. The title of, of this little thing that we have that teaching is wrong is God is in control. God is in control. And because we... Believers have said that, Christians have said that, the world looks at it and thinks if God's in control, what about the child sex trade? What about all this starvation? What about all this ugliness? And then they even, people even, Christians say, well, God sent that hurricane just to judge those people. Because God's in control. And, and some of you that have been with us for a long time might say, Pastor Arlene, you've gone over all this stuff before. That's all right. Peter said, I put you in remembrance again. I can put you in remembrance again. Amen. Because what we think about this will really determine if we know Jesus. If we have that intimate relationship with Jesus. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see who's in control. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, let who? Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Notice people aren't in there. But God said, they will have dominion. Who's got dominion? Next verse. So God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. God created him male and female. He created them. There are two races, male and female. That's it. You're either a male or you're a female. I don't care what the world tells you, but you're either a male or a female. That's it. God only made two, male and female. Stop the confusion. Get back to what the word says. The way you were born is what you are, a male or a female. That's it. And the body of Christ has to smarten up and quit going the way of the world and making excuses and trying, saying it's okay. We are to be an example in this earth today. A place where people can go and be made free. Amen. And we're not going to be conformed to the way the world thinks. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen? We'll see if this one stays up. We did have one message taken down. But that's all right. The word of God is not bound. Next verse. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. Take dominion. Who is in control of the earth? He gave it to man. To say God's in control is a cop-out. 
God gave man the authority. Man bowed his knee and gave that authority to Satan. But glory to God, let's read Matthew 28. Because in Corinthians it says that Satan is God of this world system. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus went, defeated Satan, got the authority back. Next verse. Go you, go, go. He's saying, I've got the authority, now I'm commissioning you. You go in my authority. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Next verse. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Go back and find out what Jesus commanded. He did not command them to obey the law of Moses. He said, I came to fulfill the law. He kept every part of it for us. And we're in him. So God sees me in him. So it's as if I've kept it all. And lo, I am with you always. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Even to the end of the age. He said, you go. I got that authority back. You know, come on. Jesus didn't need to get the authority back for himself. He had all the authority necessary in heaven. He got it back for us. Back to the Garden of Eden authority. Let's look at And then, it, you know, you can go into Mark 16 where Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, exercising your authority. Speak with new tongues, cast out demons. No deadly thing will harm you. That is vital today that we realize when we've laid our body down, it is protected from any deadly thing, viruses, etc. They that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I've heard people, here's another teaching, that you have to do all these various things. <clears throat> it's not even, anyway, do these various things to get into the secret place. Wrong. Jesus, I'm in him. I'm in the secret place of the Most High. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I don't have to make myself good enough to get into the secret place. Oh, no, Jesus made me good enough. And I'm there. I'm there in the secret place of the Most High. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I say of the Lord, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stop looking at yourself thinking you have to do something to get something from God. Yes, there's things we do, but it's by faith accessing what God's already given us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So that if we think and believe that God is in control, our knowledge of Jesus will be messed up. It will be, our knowledge of him will be all painted with he's in control and ah, I'm, I'm just such a spiritual person and I'm so religious and I just believe God's in control and I'm just waiting, 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 waiting for God to just do something. And then I make excuses. Oh, he's so smart so he killed 100,000 people with this. Oh, but he knows what he's doing because he's in control. Nonsense. God's not a murderer. And he's not killing people. He said he would that none should perish. And he's not going to send something that's going to wipe out a whole bunch of people. So if we think God's in control, it is going to skew our thinking and realizing of who Jesus is. And we won't enter into those divine promises. We won't understand them. Because God's in control, and if he really wanted me to have it, he would do something. Just like I said this morning during the offering. Well, that's an idea from God, but I'm just going to wait and see what God's going to do about it. If it really is God, I'm just not going to push it. Well, just believe God and take a step and see what he has to say. Put your hand to something. It'll be blessed. Hallelujah. 
So now, with that God's in control, because people think that, then they think he's judging the earth. Judging, judging. Oh, God's a God of judgment. Well, let's go to John 12, 31 to 32. John 12, 31 to 32. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now is the judgment of this world. Now, you have to read all the beginning of it. I could have read the first couple of chapters, the preceding couple of chapters. But God's, Jesus is talking to them about judgment, about who's going to be judged, what's going to happen. And now he says... The judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The judgment of this world. The ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of the world? He was talking about Satan, the devil. He is God of this world system. Adam gave his authority to Satan. But Jesus said the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. Next verse. And if I be lifted up from the earth, now they've in this is New King James, but in the original it doesn't, and in the old King James it has it in italics where I will draw all people. It's not saying that. If you read it, and I understand, Holy Spirit draws, understand. But this is not what he's saying, because if he's drawing all people, all people should be saved. But he's saying he will draw all judgment. He's talking about judgment. So he's going to draw all judgment to himself. If he's lifted up, was he lifted up? Where did your and my judgment go? On Jesus. Who paid the price for my judgment? Jesus. Is God going to judge me if he already judged Jesus for me? Think about it. It doesn't make sense. Isaiah 54, 8. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you. And this is coming after, remember, this is verse after chapter 53, which is talking about Jesus paying the price, going to the cross, becoming sick, sin, etc. I hid my face from you for a moment. Who did he hide his face from? Jesus. Jesus. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. He's our Redeemer. He's our Redeemer. Next verse. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry. No judgment. With you nor rebuke you. Now here's what you've got to understand. When you're reading the word, you see Jesus, but you also have to see covenant. He had a covenant with Noah. Did Noah have to do anything to get the covenant or the promise? He just followed God's instructions and built an ark. He didn't build the ark to get into covenant. He was in covenant. That's an unconditional covenant which is what we have with Jesus. I don't have to do anything. The Holy Spirit draws me. The Holy Spirit gives me revelation, knowledge of Jesus. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Noah built the ark. It is an unconditional covenant. There are conditional covenants which when he spoke to the Israelites, you do this and then I'll do that. We don't have that. And it's as the waters of Noah covered the earth. So it's the same type of covenant. When it's conditional, both parties have to do something and agree. With unconditional, I didn't have to agree. It just needed Jesus to agree with God. And I get in through him. We have to remember, the covenant isn't between me and God. It's between God and Jesus, and I get in. We're talking about judgment. Was Jesus judged for the sins of the world? It says, I was crucified with Christ. I was raised with Christ. When were my sins judged? When I was crucified with him. You see, I might never accept it, 
I might never make Jesus Lord of my life, but my sins are not going to send me to hell. One thing, if I make a choice to not accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have made the choice to go to hell. But my, the judgment, the price for my sin, everybody's sin, was laid on Jesus. God's already judged it. God has already judged all sin. There's no stipulations that I have to do to keep that covenant. Whereas with the Israelites, in the Old Testament covenant, God said, if you do this, then I'll do this. You don't do that, you're done, you're toast. But when you look at it and read it, God's mercy and grace was so overflowing, they would come back and everything was okay. But we are in an unconditional covenant because we've come through Jesus. And everything you've ever done in the past, ever will do in the future, the judgment for that sin has been put on Jesus and has been paid in full. Colossians says, the handwriting that was against me was nailed to the cross. Every sin I ever committed or would commit was nailed to the cross. And it was the blood of Jesus just flowed over that, and it was a blank page. Blank page. I'm not being judged. God's not judging the world. He will. He will. When Adam's lease runs out, after the rapture, and there will be the great white throne judgment, there will be judgment. But not now. Did we look at 9, verse 9? Did we look at 10? Where do we go with that? Let's, 9. For this like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you. He's comparing chapter 53, what Jesus did at the cross to us, the ark. Noah went in the ark. He was safe. We are in the ark of Jesus. We're safe. He will not be angry or rebuke us. The Holy Spirit leads. The Word of God teaches. And that's how we're corrected. But God is not an angry God. All, just think about this. All of God's anger was poured out on Jesus. Jesus took it all for us. Next verse. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. So the mountains might go the hills might go, but what's he saying? My kindness shall not depart from you. His kindness will not depart from me. His kindness will not depart from you. Stop and think about this. He's not judging you. He's not mad at you. You can miss it a thousand times, but he's never mad at you, and his kindness will never leave you. That is so powerful. If you're thinking wrong, you will be feeling wrong and you will be believing the wrong thing about Jesus. Nor shall my covenant of peace, his peace, Jesus, your peace is always with you. Says the Lord who has mercy on you. This is powerful. If we don't understand judgment, that it's already been on Jesus, we are going to end up thinking about him wrong, and we will not walk into the precious divine promises that he has for us because our knowledge will be wrong, and it will color everything that we do. So glory to God. Anyone who is blaming the Lord for their grief and misery is wrong. The Lord is not the one who is angry with us and rebuking us according to this unconditional covenant. And I really don't give a rip what religion says or anybody else says. 
This is the word of God. And God is not judging. And he loves me. And his kindness is always for me. No matter what I've done or what I will do, he looks at me with kindness. And that just changes the whole way I see my knowledge of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you thankful this morning? You know, I am so glad. I am so thankful that my relationship with my heavenly father isn't based on my works. All I had to do was when the Holy Spirit drew me and revealed to me Jesus. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. Confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord. But I'm talking about making he, when you confess Jesus is Lord, you make him Lord of your life. You follow what the word says. People think, well, I have to do what the word says. Well, it's not that hard. Just change the way you think. Renew your mind to the word of God. And it becomes easy. Because you will begin to think like God thinks. As long as I had to love, you know, that whole thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, and your neighbor as yourself. That's old covenant. That is a conditional covenant. It says in 1 John that I love God because he first loved me. When I start seeing what he did for me, I don't have to be told to love him. Love flows. It just, it's just there. And when I want, he says love others, love your neighbor as I love you, all I have to do is start thinking about how much he loved me. Makes loving others easy. Not necessarily what I like. Now, I'm not talking about occasionally my flesh might rise up. You know, there's times. I'm still renewing my mind. If the wrong buttons push, sometimes I react wrong. But it's less and less as I see and gain in my knowledge of Jesus. I'm no longer looking at him as a judgmental person up there. And when I realize that that judgment was put on Jesus, how can you help but be grateful and thankful? Suddenly you're no longer looking at yourself. There's another book we might do as a Bible study one day. Selfishness, the source of all grief. That'll jerk some slack out of you. It did me. Sometimes I get these books, I read them, and I think, Lord, I really would have rather not. Because now you're responsible for it. But we have to learn to get our eyes on Jesus. And get our eyes off ourselves. And the more we have our eyes on ourselves, the more miserable, depressed we will be. And it's, when I think, you know, when you realize Jesus... Paid the price for you and for me. He didn't even know if we would respond. He did it to please his father. I only do those things that please my father. So if I have that attitude, I'm not going to then, whether it's my husband, my children, a friend, if I truly love you, I am doing it not to get rewarded by you. I'm doing it to help your life be better. So you will know how much Jesus loves you. That's it, the word, it says that we're the mirror that people see of Jesus. We're the Jesus they see. And in a body of Christ... It's time that they see the Jesus in one another. And the body of Christ should be walking in this peace. And if we can't get along here together, it's going to be a mess out there. But everything we do should be so people know how much God 
loves them. How much Jesus did for them. Not for me to get something from you. Not to impress you. Not to make you feel good because, oh, Pastor Arlene's so marvelous she did this. No. It's so you know how much Jesus loves you and what he did for you. That's what it's all about. Then we can walk in peace and victory as we get to know him more. Hallelujah. Please stand.